We would like to recognize that we are working on the traditional lands of the Nakazli Waten First Nations. Reflect on aspects of what you have done in the classroom in the past and relate your experiences and practices to the literature review. How do you plan to continue to use these practices in the future? Prior to this project, we have had the luxury of working together as we all teach in the same small rural school and have a very cohesive staff. That said, we have also previously believed in modern constructivist educational learning theory, which according to the literature, students learn best through real world projects, which also seek to activate their prior knowledge. Since we have previously believed this educational theory to be accurate, we have historically attempted to build projects that met these criteria. That is, we have designed a project, attempted to ensure that it was relevant and meaningful to the learners. Uh, regarding our major project, as our school community is comprised of roughly 70% First Nations population, we wanted to focus on a project that was meaningful to both our school and community at large, while also meeting curricular constraints. Since our educational values are shared with the surrounding First Nations communities, we also felt that it was important to design a project that met this constructivist theory for all of the stakeholders. The literature states that using constructivism as a learning theory helps support learner productivity, improves engagement, and helps in the development of new knowledge. We have found that by making our project relevant to our students' lives, that this is indeed accurate. Uh, looking at co-teaching, in the past, Andrew and I have co-taught a specific computer numerically controlled routing course together. Additionally, we have worked to implement co-teaching practices in our day-to-day -day courses by combining projects such as computer design and then implementation in the shop. Uh, the literature is fairly clear that co-teaching is beneficial to both educators and students as it allows both to sort of break out of the mold, so to speak, and allows teachers to teach to their own strengths. This ultimately means that students are receiving the best education possible as they have Andrew, for example, teaching and working with students in his area of expertise, which is computer graphic and technical design. Well, at the same time, then they have me teaching towards my area of expertise, which is carpentry, joinery, and CNC operations. According to the literature, and in conjunction with what we have found in practice, this gives students multiple viewpoints and learning opportunities that they would not otherwise receive in a traditional classroom setting. As far as our major project is concerned, we took this a step further by also having Deirdre facilitate the social studies inquiry regarding the significance of the truth and reconciliation process. We were all then able to assist the students throughout the project to our areas of strength. Continuing on with co-teaching, in the past, I have had students work in alternative spaces such as the computer lab or shop with Andrew and Gary. Although students were helped and supervised by Andrew and Gary, we were not working as an organized co-teaching unit. We found this learning manner not as effective as it was not clear who the teacher in charge was and students were often confused as to who they should turn to for assistance and assessment was often a concern, which was more difficult for the supervising teacher to comment on. The literature in our study reinforced these points as a possible concern when co-teaching is not established effectively. Furthermore, the literature states that it is important for teachers to design a concrete plan, share responsibilities, and assess students together while also providing time for educators to discuss and reflect upon lessons and student work. These are things that we improved upon in our main project for this degree. Linked to the concept of co-teaching is the idea of collaborative learning for both teachers and students. For collaboration to be effective, it must be done in a manner that fosters respect amongst all participants and is not forced. In the past, we have tried to implement cross-departmental lines and increase teacher collaboration throughout the school, though sometimes it worked and others it was difficult or challenging. For our main project, Andrew, Gary and myself collaborated extensively to create a project that, was, that is a respectful representation of our school culture across the subject areas of social studies, computer technology, and carpentry joinery. We have found the benefits of staff collaboration, according to the literature, 
are helping to end isolation, increase guidance, increase motivation, and help reflect on one another's practices. We have found through our collaborative journey that this is accurate and this process helps to greatly improve our own teaching practices. As for student collaboration, the literature states it is also uh, enables their voices to be heard and promotes their individuality. Students can also serve as mentors to one another and support each other's learning. In the past, we've all tried to have students work together but have had some challenges. Our master's project was really the first main project where we have had and needed students to collaborate effectively to meet a common goal. Students responded very well to this. They help each other a great deal with the creative design aspects as well as many of the technical aspects. Our project really exemplified how successful collaboration can be when established with a solid framework and focused on. Moving on to project-based learning. In the past, we have all found project-based learning to be an immensely important teaching tool in our schools. A great deal of our students find project-based learning to be engaging and helps to motivate them. The literature states that this is because students are given a choice as to what they want to focus on, which makes their projects meaningful to them. According to our research, PBL also helps students to learn creativity, deep thinking, and transferable skills that may not be otherwise learned via the traditional stand and deliver curriculum. Gary and I have been teaching our courses using PBL as a focus for many years. Students choose the project after learning the basic skills and learn additional skills by completing that project. This, as you can imagine, works very well in both the computer lab and the carpentry shops as there is plenty of room in the curriculum to support this style of learning. Deirdre also implements a number of PBL projects into her teaching environment, but has felt constrained by some extent by the lack of physical space, as well as the curricular need to knows that are difficult to cover by broad projects. We have found that the process that supports PBL is the inquiry process. This inquiry process helps guide students to question investigate, and construct new understanding and knowledge. Although the inquiry process is not necessarily tied to project-based learning, we found it helps a great deal to guide students in a successful project, as PBL adds an important element of hands-on learning to the inquiry process. In the past, we have done very little inquiry work and have focused mostly on project-based learning. Deirdre did a little inquiry work in the Humanities Department but has never used it in a cross-curricular manner. As such, our major project was the first time the three of us worked extensively with inquiry. Our research shows us that the inquiry process is learner-focused and much like PBL, assists the development of critical thinking skills. Perhaps most importantly, inquiry, especially guided inquiry, provides the framework for outlining the steps students need to take in their learning. According to the literature, this gives the student voice in their learning and takes into account natural differentiation for each student, thereby supporting equity within the classroom. In our major project, we found inquiry to be an invaluable tool for helping to frame and structure the projects. The structure helped guide not only the students, but us as professionals, and keep our collaboration focused and meaningful. In the future, the three of us would like to continue using project-based learning, cross-curricular learning, co-teaching, and inquiry learning to guide our instructional practice and support students' motivation and learning. We likely will do this on a smaller scale, however, as the major project was costly and a significant amount of additional work. Ultimately, we would like to see students be able to flow throughout the school to make use of all the faculty's expertise as well as all the school facilities. Consider the implications of educational practices and theories in relation to social, cultural, and cross-cultural context. How might Western practices be realized in another cultural context? Our goal with this project was to use learning theory, so constructivism, co-teaching, collaboration, project-based learning, and inquiry, to increase student motivation in learning in the cross-cultural context of First Nations Truth and Reconciliation. As a vital part of this project, we collaborated with local knowledge holders 
to ensure the Western teaching practices listed above could be used to not only help our students meet the curricular competencies, but also engage with the subject matter in a meaningful and relevant fashion that helps us grow as a school and also as a community as a whole. In a traditional social studies setting, upon completing a specific unit or focus of study, students would likely complete some form of a small research project, such as an essay or a hands-on project to demonstrate their learning. The constraints of this teaching method, however, are that they neither provide nor support learners with an in-depth learning experience. However, the institution of co-teaching, collaborative learning, inquiry processes, and project-based learning provided our students with choice and voice in their learning content. It enabled them to be creative, it encouraged peer assistance, and it developed a level of respect for each other's learning interests. Furthermore, students reaped the benefits of learning and building knowledge from different educators, while at the same time developed transferable skills such as communication and problem solving that will be valuable throughout their lives. We are fortunate enough to work with our local elders and knowledge holders who enhanced our conception of what this project could be by encouraging us to use local language and ways of knowing. For example, our school's mission statement on the truth and reconciliation process is not only presented in English, but also in Decalf and syllabics, which were translated by our, by our local knowledge holders. This encouragement from a micro-community outlook to a macro-world vision was noted in their suggestion to use woods from around the world in the students' carving process, as it would encompass the unique cultures we have in our school and the community at large. Consider the limitations and challenges of your review and new questions that arose from your review, as well as personal reflections on the impacts on ourselves and our profession. The largest obstacle we needed to overcome with this project was definitely due to all of the changes because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, they were many and included, but definitely weren't limited to like students and stakeholders not having access to the schools. Uh, access to student work was changed and how it was handed in was modified. Uh, not all of the students were able to use the software or have direct access to the carpentry shop. Some of the students stopped attending, uh, but it was still encouraging to see other students want to get involved in the project and help complete it. A great deal of the joinery for this project was left for only a few students who were able to have access to the carpentry shop. Again, thankfully, several carpentry students originally outside the scope of the project stepped up to help with this legacy piece. Uh, many students were needed to do the finishing carpentry work for their piece at home, so uh, providing them with materials and establishing a drop-off and pickup system was also necessary to achieve this. Another limitation of the study was that it was done for a specific large-scale legacy project. So the nature of this project had a really enticing effect as it was to be permanently mounted on the school wall. So I'm wondering if a smaller project or smaller projects that were conducted in the same manner, would they be as enticing for students? I believe moving forward, one of the components of this project that resonated the most with me was the co-teaching and collaboration time I spent with Deirdre and Andrew. Uh, throughout the process, we have grown as professionals and had time to reflect on our own practice as never before. As such, I believe our students gained more insight and learned at a capacity that would not have been possible without this collaboration. Uh, finally, I plan to continue running all of the shop projects using the inquiry-based PBL platform we use throughout our major project. I also plan to continue with our co-teaching and staff collaboration endeavors as they are vital for my professional growth as well as enabling students to enjoy cross-curricular learning. I've recently acquired a new CNC laser cutter slash engraver for the shop which should also help to enable more cross-curricular learning throughout the school. So hopefully we can get other teachers around the school on board with using the shop for cross-curricular learning as well. Two areas that were both challenging and eye-opening as an educator with this project include COVID-19's impact on our school environment and the completion of our ethics review to gain and report on students' learning experience. First, COVID-19 drastically changed how our project unfolded. 
Initially, students had to work from home until our district was given permission to allow learners access back into the school. However, this change was optional for families. We as educators provided work in various forms to students, including video conferencing, texting, emailing, and or providing hard copies of work and materials that were delivered directly to students that were not back in the classroom. My Social Studies 10 students that were involved in this project were hit with limitations in their inquiry process as many did not have access to computers or may not have had internet access. Therefore, the initial style of inquiry that I chose, which was open inquiry, had to be changed to guided inquiry for those students who did not have a computer or internet access. For those students who had both computers at home and access to the internet, they were able to continue with their open inquiry. However, for those with no computer or internet access, I had to provide them with a variety of hard copies of resources from which they could then work from to complete their inquiry. Therefore, their resources were not of their choosing. Upon completing their inquiry project, students were instructed to pick one piece of information that resonated with them from their investigation and create a motif that would represent their learning. Students could also include a quote or statement to enhance their motif. The ethics review was the second hurdle we had to complete in order to gain permission to interview students and stakeholders and enable their presentation to be included in our project. It was an unexpected addition that we spent close to three months working on and stressing over to the point where we almost canceled the media portion of this project. Ultimately, we were glad we stuck with it and were approved so that we can better portray the learning that took place by providing students and stakeholders first-hand accounts. Moving forward, I would definitely continue to implement collaborative co-teaching, inquiry, and project-based learning into my teaching practices. This experience working, collaborating, reflecting, and learning alongside Gary and Andrew has provided me with new energy in my teaching areas, for which I'm grateful and excited to bring to my classroom and share with my students, even if on a smaller scale than this project. It would have been easy to change the scope of our project due to COVID-19, but we decided to proceed and modify as needed. This really challenged our adaptability as professionals, and we are glad we persevered. As such, the learning went beyond the initial social studies classroom and really became a school-wide project. Some designs didn't work out and needed changing. The limitations of our software would make it so not everything transferred perfectly. There were edits the students had to do. It was sent back to them. They sent it back to us, and we would then incorporate it into their final section of the feather. We were proud the students were able to adapt to this situation, though it would have been ideal if they were in the computer lab with me and making these changes themselves. Though this was for a master's project and was very large in scope, something of this size would not be able to be repeated for each class. This was a massive undertaking that we learned as we progressed. The concept was simple enough, but the completion was anything but simple. We learned a lot and would love to do something similar, but in a much smaller fashion. We learned for both, the learning for both students and ourselves was amazing. Simply put, what is big is not easy, and what is easy is not big. Final statements. In spite of everything, I believe if our profession was to make a single change, it would be to provide teachers greater opportunity to move outside their traditional classroom boundaries and get together collectively and collaborate with each other. Working so closely with your colleagues makes you want to do more with your students, more projects, more field trips, ask more questions, investigate more answers. It helps us sort of regain the excitement for our subjects and really think about ways to explore and create like never before. In spite of the challenges, I am grateful for the process that Gary, Andrew, and myself learned and pursued through as educators. Furthermore, I am awed at the work that our students created that led to the school's and community's truth and reconciliation legacy wall that we can reflect upon and learn from both now and in the future. In the end, I would have to say that this was an incredibly enlightening and humbling process. The reception from the school and the community to our legacy wall has made it all worth it. We are going to grow only through having tough conversations, and only that way can we move towards true truth and reconciliation. Gary and Deirdre were amazing to work with, 
And honestly, I wouldn't do it any differently.